Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Seattle is a beautiful city. It's my first time. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, so I changed a little bit the title to spinal instability secondary to metastasis because we are concerned with uh, if the spine is stable or not in our patients. And uh, so a, great, a big advancement uh, was the publication of this paper here. And this is a, a study where uh, a panel of specialists got together and, uh, and they set uh, criteria for what would be the risk factors for instability. And based on this, uh, a score was created. And uh, as uh, uh, features of the tumors like location, uh, type of pain, if the, the lesion was lytic or not, uh, radiographic alignment, uh, vertebral body collapse, and uh, involvement of the posterior elements were scored. And uh, according to this score, uh, a lower score was considered uh, what most of these specialists considered uh, spine stable. Uh, if uh, the score was intermediate, being potentially unstable, and uh, unstable would be like a higher score. And uh, this is like a more or less works like more or less like the Glasgow scoring system. It's a way that you can talk to your oncologist or a radiation oncologist, and uh, you guys, and there is a communication that uh, can flow through and uh, kind of standardizing uh, the, the 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 patient. So, for instance. This is a patient where uh, he has colon cancer, metastatic lesion to L3, and uh, this is the CT scan showing the posterior elements are, are, are uh, intact. And on this case, for instance, if I get a referral or I want to refer this case to stereotactic radiation or the oncologist calls me, hey, I have a guy with a L3 metastasis, is, is he unstable or not? At least we have a, a, a score that we can have a, a universal language. For instance, in this case, uh, is uh, located on L3, so it's in the mobile spine, gets two points. Uh, patient has some pain, mechanical pain, so he will get three points. The, lytic, the lesion is lytic, so he'll get two points. The alignment is, is normal, so he will get zero points here. The collapse is less than 50%, and uh, there is no involvement on posterior elements. So this gives a score of nine, and it's potentially unstable. That means that I can probably... Uh, not perform surgery on this patient, observe him, and move forward on the treatment, if it's radiation, if it's chemotherapy. Difference in a situation like this, this is another lesion with colon, another patient with colon cancer on T11, I'm sorry, on T10, and uh, so she has, she gets one point because she's in a semi-rigid spine. She has a lot of pain, three points. Uh, it's a lytic lesion, gets two points. There is uh, and deformity here, the collapse, uh, uh, two points. Vertebral body collapse is really big, more than 50%, and there is involvement of, of the bilateral elements. So this scene score on this case was 14. So I know that this patient, if the oncologist is sending me a patient, he will tell me, oh, I have someone with a score of 14 on the scene score. I, I don't need the scene score to tell if the patient is unstable or not, but to put a discussion on what would be the rationale for treatment, that helps a lot. So this would be the difference between a potentially unstable spine versus an unstable, a unstable spine scored by the scenes uh, classification. Okay. So uh, then once we decide that the patient has an unstable spine, how can we fix that? So uh, we, we can obviously perform an open surgery, but there are other interventions that are less aggressive that will derail the patient less uh, than... Uh, than uh, than an open surgery. Let's say someone who needs chemotherapy, we can't wait very long. Uh, and uh, this uh, cement augmentation is a very good uh, alternative. And even percutaneous stabilization is another good alternative. For instance, this patient came to me. She's newly diagnosed with breast cancer. She has extensive metastatic disease on the skeleton. And uh, she couldn't walk because of pain. She was in a wheelchair and a high dose of narcotics. The oncologist wanted to start chemotherapy, the radiation. Oncologist felt that she has too much extensive, too many metastases. Uh, he can even radiate anything meaningfully. So the decision was to proceed with chemotherapy uh, as soon as possible. However, uh, given her, uh, her her pain, she couldn't start chemotherapy. So then I, they came to me and asked, "What can I do?" So in looking here, looks like she has a, despite of the extensive skeletal involvement, 
seems that L3 here was the biggest problem. Scoring her on the seams, the pain location was in the mobile spine. She had a lot of pain, is a lytic lesion. The alignment is a little bit, uh, uh, is a de novo deformity here. There is a collapse of more than 50% of the vertebral body. Posterior elements are involved. So she's an unstable spine. Then uh, we proposed to f an alternative to avoid delays on her systemic treatment, cement augmentation. And this is how we do cement augmentation. There is disruption of the posterior element. So on these cases, I, I like to do kyphoplasties. I think you create, the balloon creates a cavity. There is less pressure on the cement injection. So this is how we do it. So we cannulate the pedicle. And uh, once we are in the center of the pedicle, you should be in the back of the vertebral body. You inject the needles. I like to do bilateral transpedicular. Once the needle is in the body, I tend to go in the anterior portion of the vertebral body. And then uh, we, uh, we inflate the balloons uh, on the anterior portion. And uh, usually the balloon, I know how much I am inflating. So if I inject three cc's each balloon, I know that I can probably inject three cc's of cement safely because there is less resistance around the balloon. So this is the balloon here. And uh, we always look if there is, uh, you know, extravasation of cement in the back, but it's very important. Anterior extravasation also can happen. So this is this injection of cement. As we inject cement here, we see that the, the cavity gets filled and uh, we are uh, probably improving the axial loading capacity of this spine here. And that's the final injection here. So uh, this is the final uh, result. Her pain significantly decreased and she started chemotherapy one week after we saw her. So this is a very good mod way to patients that have failure of the anterior column. Uh, cement augmentation is a very interesting alternative for this patient, especially in situations like this where you don't, your window of opportunity is narrow. So you can, always, you can always add percutaneous stabilization. If you, for instance, if in that case I wasn't satisfied with my cement injection, another option would be uh, augmenting with percutaneous stabilization. And you can even augment the percutaneous stabilization with cement, and that's very easy to be done. So in order to do uh, per, uh, these procedures, this is a very nice uh, handbook that Mike Wang wrote, and um, it shows the perfect fluoroscopic image. And then on the perfect fluoroscopic image, the pedicle is below the end plate. The end plate has just a single shadow. The pedicles are, uh, the distance of the pedicles in the spinous process is the same on both sides and the lower end plate is also a single shadow. And then on the lateral uh, is all a single shadow of everything, especially the pedicle and the identification of the foramen. Sometimes with scoliosis or rotation of the spine, uh, this is an end face view of the pedicle. That's another way to do it, uh, to cannulate this, those pedicles. In this image, the distance between the pedicle and the, the spinous process is a little wider on one side, but you can see well the entire contour of the pedicle. It's a straight shot through the pedicle. And, um, and sometimes we have cases like this. This is another case where uh, we didn't have a good option to perform an open procedure. This is a 64-year-old lady, morbid obese, diabetic, uh, had a DVT that uh, she was anticoagulated, and she had this unknown primary carcinoma that uh, she was uh, unable to treat to get, uh, she got like four or five different chemotherapies and there was no more systemic treatment that they could offer. And she had this very destructive lesion on the pelvis here. She couldn't stand up because of a, a sacral insufficiency. And uh, <clears throat> on her case, uh, we felt that she was not a good candidate for an open procedure given her comorbidities. And we performed all this stabilization percutaneously. So this is a view of the, uh, of the iliac wing. So we have this teardrop. And uh, we can perform this uh, percutaneously. And uh, on her case, we augmented, since we are not expecting a fusion and we want to have a durable result, the biomechanical stress on this construct would be very, would be very, very hard. And uh, we decided to augment this, the, the screws with cement. So when we put my needle, before I, I change the K-wire, we inject cement. Then we put a K-wire, we remove the needle, and then we drop the screw. And, uh, and uh, this became a very strong construct. She survived another eight months, and she had a significant improvement on her pain. Um, so uh, putting all the, together what we are, uh, we're perf uh, our practice for oncology significantly changed after the advent of stereotactic radiation. We're going to have a couple of talks uh, on, the, on the topic. But uh, we are seeing more and more the development of fractures after the stereotactic radiation. And uh, 
there are three good papers uh, series that reported uh, this, the, the incidence of fractures. And uh, the first came from Maslow and Catherine, and uh, they reported 39% of fractures after stereotactic radiation. That was a very uh, high number. And uh, then MD Anderson reported 11%. Looks like we are doing less uh, fractures. And University of Toronto uh, uh, reported 20% of fractures. Looking on this paper, it seems that lytic lesions was like a common denominator on the development of, of those fractures. But none of these studies used the scene score. The scene score was published in 2010, but these two studies didn't look on the scene score of those patients <clears throat> who developed fracture. This is the paper uh, from Toronto who looked uh, on, uh, on, on, on the on the risk factors, and uh, they showed uh, that after stereotactic radiation, there is this progression of fractures. And then they identified uh, the dose of radiation as another risk factor, meaning the more, the higher the dose of radiation, the higher the risk of, of fractures. And then uh, finally came this paper uh, where uh, the SIN score was applied to try to understand what's the risk factor of developing a fracture after stereotactic radiation. And this is a combination of a series from MD Anderson, Cleveland Clinic, and University of Toronto. Total of 252 patients undergone uh, stereotactic radiation. 410 spinal segments were was treated on this combined population. And the incidence of fractures was uh, roughly uh, 14%. So we have literature saying that it's, 30 per, it's up to 39% down to 11%. And this paper that combined everything and used the scene score reporting 13%. On this paper, most fractures occurred within three months. Uh, 24 grays or more was a significant risk of, uh, of uh, development of fractures. And lytic lesions, vertebral body collapse, and changes in alignment were independent risk predictors, meaning that those components of the scene score were more important uh, than the scene score overall to predict the development of fractures. And this is, a, this is a table showing that vertebral body collapse, uh, those of radiation alignment, um, were in, independent predictors. But the, another important lesson here is that most fractures occurred on the first uh, three, four months after treatment, and the dose of radiation, 24 grays in single fraction, was really an uh, independent risk factor of developing uh, those fractures. And then we were practicing uh, in Anderson, and we face we get faced a lot with this uh, situation here. This is a patient that came to me a few months ago, and she has a 54-year-old. She's morbid obese, diabetic. She has breast cancer that uh, is hormonal uh, receptor positive, so she's treated with tamoxifen relatively well systemically, but she developed back pain, and she was found to have this lesion here. So I applied the scene score, and I got a, a score of potentially unstable. The oncologist called me and said, hey, she's doing okay with uh, tamoxifen. I don't want to change her chemotherapy. Uh, and we have this only meta uh, single metastatic lesion in there. Can you resect it? Then uh, I went back to him and I said, well, what's the reason for me to resect that? You want me to resect to eradicate the disease? So that's the only cytometastasis. The rest seems okay. Then we discussed our ca our, her case in our multidisciplinary conference. And uh, we felt that we could uh, give an ablative dose of stereotactic radiation to this tumor, and that would avoid uh, performing a, a name block resection or a more uh, or a intralesional resection with stabilization. Anyway, and then okay, so we decided to do stereotactic radiation. What's the risk of this patient developing worsening of this fracture? Is it 39% like Sloan Catherine said? Is this 11% like we said, or this is 20% like Toronto, or is 15% like the other paper said? And so uh, that's a, the question that uh, we didn't have the answer, but we did then, we went back in our series and we did a study and we have a manuscript that we are uh, submitting, and uh, we looked on the scene score. So can the scene score predict the risk of fracture? This is that paper that I just showed from Sego, and uh, they, when they classified as in the, in, like potentially unstable, they report 20% of fractures. If the patient was scored as stable, he's reporting 6% of fractures. So 20% is a number that is already there in the literature. Is this the real number? So this study 
use the CIN score, but the CIN score itself was not a predictor of the development of fracture. So what's the purpose of a score that doesn't predict? And then we went back and we wanted to see if this is the real case or not. So basically our study, we went on 206 patients that underwent radiation in MD Anderson. And uh, we applied the Bielski score. We're going to discuss the Bielski score uh, probably later. But Bielski score basically is the amount of epidural tumor. And, patient, and we selected patients with little epidural tumor, meaning that those are the patients here that stereotactic radiation is what is the definitive treatment. We're not planning to do surgery on those guys. So then we got 79 patients. So out of the 206 patients that underwent stereo, 79 had just a tumor within the vertebral body or very little, maybe a millimeter of extension to the epidural space. And everybody already got stereotactic radiation. But we went back and we applied the scene score on those guys. So we had 41 patients that had a scenes of stable and we had 38 patients with potentially unstable. So on the group that had uh, stable, we had 17% of fractures. On the group that were potentially unstable, we had 66% of incidence of fractures. The difference is that among those fractures, only 7% were symptomatic fractures that required the further treatment. And on this group here, we had 31% of symptomatic fractures that required further treatment. So overall, uh, we had a 19% of incidence of fracture, a number very similar to the Toronto number. But if we apply the scene score, the number of symptomatic fractures jumps to 31%. So uh, our, con and then uh, the scene score was, an was the only independent predictor of development of symptomatic fractures in our group. And uh, this is a multivariate analysis showing that the scene score is the only uh, predictor. And uh, based on this, we performed a kyphoplasty on this lady. She's doing very well. We, we have more than four months of follow-up. Her pain got better. And she got an ablative dose of stereotactic radiation. And on the follow-up imaging, she, uh, her tumor is controlled. So based on this, we are now, uh, uh, so just concluding, we, the C score is useful to predict the development of vertebral body compression fractures after stereotactic radiation. The incidence of fractures, symptomatic and asymptomatic, they are higher when you have a potentially unstable score versus a stable score. And patients with higher C score, they tend to have symptomatic fractures uh, way more than uh, if they are known, if they are with a lower score. So based on this data, we now have a randomized trial where we're getting patients with potentially unstable spines prior to stereotactic radiation. And uh, we are randomizing them for kyphoplasty upfront of radiation versus no kyphoplasty. And we want to see if there is a uh, a decrease in the incidence or progression of fractures with this intervention. Thank you.